He is the founder director of the International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore, a new generation institute. He has been teaching for more than two decades in the number one engineering school and number one business schools in India. He has authored several textbooks, is a referee in several journals, and serves on the editorial boards of many. He is also a board member in many private and public sector companies and universities. Professor Sadhagopan represents India in the TC9 committee of the IFIP. He is a fellow of the Institute of Engineers India, council member of the OR Society of India, life member of the Computer Society of India, voting member of the Association of Computing Machinery, member of the IEEE Computer Society, and a member of the Association of Information Systems. It is our privilege to welcome on stage Professor Sadhagopan. Good morning. Thank you, Sunil, Himanshu, and Doc, Dr. Gururaj. And this is CSI is in its seventh year, and you have been kind enough to call me for the third time. And I'm specially grateful. And it is always nice to be in God's own country. Good to be in Cochin. So I normally come and spend at least two days for CSI because you have amazing shows and demos and talks. But this time, I couldn't benefit from it. But uh, that's why I'm here. Thank you. So what I thought I will do is, first and foremost, no slides. Okay. So we'll have about five to six minutes on three topics. Okay. Uh, the, the key message I want you to remember is that looks like looking at computing for a while, we are getting into what I call net 3.0. What is net 3.0? The net 1.0 is all about connecting computers. You make computers, faster computers, better computers. Dr. Gurraj knows how to make the best one. So just as you have the fastest man on the planet, you have the fastest computer on the planet. That's a nice thing. Okay. But computers and computers, and kind of connect the computers. That's what we all did when we all went to school. But I think last maybe 20, 25 years, 30 years, we kind of started connecting computers to human beings. Starting with email at one level, and Facebook and Tweet today. It will probably change something else. Okay. I think we are about to start into something more interesting, which is connecting computers, of course, connecting human beings and computers, and far more interesting, connecting human beings and computers and things. What those things are, many, many of them, including the little speaker which conked off, OK? So a whole bunch of them, you know, the projector, the mics, the little stuff, whole bunch of them. And you might have heard of this buzzword called Internet of Things, the IoT. That is a small part of it. IoT focuses on connecting things to the computers. But I think what the world is much more interesting is, I think what makes the world interesting is still we people, human beings, right? Computers, networks are not interesting. They became more interesting when we got on. Connecting things will be interesting, but connecting things will be far more interesting when we are also there. I think that is what is going to be the nature of the things. Okay. So what's interesting is that is it kind of uh, happening? It's kind of yes or no. And whenever something happens like this, the landscape changes. I still remember 1976. There was a big master's a thesis kind of a project of connecting two DEC-10 computers running VMS. Same box, identical box from the same manufacturer running the same operating system. The only thing was you could get onto any one other terminal and use all the resources of all other things. Such a big deal. And today, who cares? Today, we no longer connect computers. You turn on, you get connected to the network. So you no longer network the computers. You get on to the network. So in the process, lots of things have changed. We all use the email because we wanted a research paper from a fellow professor in another university. 
Today, people use email to date. So nobody thought that email would do that kind of a function, right? So what happens is it completely changes the way for which it was intended. It is no longer a simple communication between two computers. It changes the way people are actually using computers to do the whole range of things. And look at, I'll give you a couple of examples of already the connecting computers and human beings and things are benefiting. 1976, I flew from Madras to Chicago, British Airways. Things were computerized. We could actually go to a British Airways office, typically one office in the full city, and they had a system called Sabre, and things were computerized. But what happened was the computer network did not connect the human beings, right? And you remember that until about 10 years back, particularly when we kind of travel abroad, you have to very carefully preserve something called a paper ticket with so many leaves. Once I was visiting uh, the G headquarters, you know, a small town near uh, New York, and when I, I was flying out of the town and directly taking a flight, international flight to India, the lady there by mistake kind of tore off, tore off the New York to JFK to London. And I kind of land, I find that I don't have the ticket. And you know the kind of problems you have. But look at it today, nobody carries the ticket. And I tell you, in this country, there is an unusual organization which even makes a big virtue out of it. Don't print tickets, bring your SMS, Indian Railways. Indian Railways no longer wants you to have tickets. They say save paper. So what has happened is a small thing called ticket they are completely dispensed with. And that is what actually connecting computers, connecting human beings, and connecting things are doing. But, you know, we have a friend, we know, poor guy, he kind of, in, he was in charge for me. So what happened was yesterday, he kept calling me, kept calling the driver, kept checking, etc., etc. But honestly speaking, today, it is not completely in place, but it is immensely possible that you could kind of tag me because there's enough av information available about me. So what happens is, as soon as I get into the train, as soon as, soon as I get into the uh, car to go to the Bangalore airport, he could have been message, don't worry, your visitor is in OK. And the moment I check in, it's all in the machine, right? He knows he has even checked in. And the moment the plane lands, he gets it, OK, don't worry, he has landed. And I meet the driver. And he calls the driver, et cetera, et cetera. There's no need, right? The moment I get into the car, he could have been. So he could have actually had a comfortable time listening to some good talks by people rather than wasting his time calling somebody, OK? So we are actually not able to do that part of the Internet of the Things. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it, OK? And to give one more example is look at, you know, at least in this country, we had something called a passbook for bank accounts. Big deal, you know, every bank account, you have to have a passbook. So now passbook has failed, right? There's nothing, right? There's no passbook. So we have actually done the Internet of Things at a couple of places. But what is not what we are not happy with is they are very simple things. We ought to do far more complex things. We'll come back, okay? So the idea is that the net 3.0, we connect computers, connect human beings, connect things. Is it very different from how the human beings evolved? If you actually look at it, the human evolution is also like this. Just look back. We had caveman, individual human beings, and some people are very powerful, some people are very thoughtful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think things changed when human beings became a society, a small society. And when people are together, Okay, they could do a lot of things. Okay. Two agricultural laborers could go together, keep yapping, keep chatting, so that they can kind of take, and sometimes they could get some emotional support. But once they get into the field, each fellow got on, did his own work. Right? And maybe two fellows kind of joined together. They were doing some other kind of a physical work. Other than chatting, they continue to do the work the same way. I think that is what is called local area network, okay? That's what local area networks did, right? You could probably share some memories, share some printers, et cetera. But I think 
societies became smart, they said that look, we can put our heads together, they came up with agricultural equipment, okay? Much before a tractor, there must have been many, many forms which you all. So that what happens, these two fellows together can actually do equivalent of 20 fellows. And then some ladies must have a job to an engineer so that you can actually make all the kitchen equipment, maybe a mixer, a grinder, a laundromat, a washing machine, and maybe a dishwasher. So uh, once these things happen, you find that people coming together could actually change a lot. Looking back, they're all the things, right? So coming of human beings was important, but making the things to work for human beings was much more important. And then they went to the next stage. They could think of something like bullock cart, maybe a horse cart. They could actually make themselves mobile. And much later, design an automobile, maybe a car, maybe a plane, maybe a ship, maybe a train, so that you can completely change. And then you could build cities, you could get suburbs, you could get a global stuff. So what we have done in the last several millenniums is that we are able to kind of connect human beings and connect things together in such a way we have a fairly complex society. And in the process, we have to create many other things. We also have to create complex structures. You know, you come to think about it, a large, a global university is a complex structure that got created by human beings. A complex government, a democracy is a complex structure got created by human beings. Right? United Nations, you know, there could be small things here and there, aberrations, but nonetheless, and today what happens is, accepting a handful of tribal people who are possibly still wanting to disconnect it, the six and a half, seven billion people is in some sense a homogeneous connected lot. We are actually seeing that in computers, right? There are no unconnected computers. Practically, every computer kind of speaks to everything else. So in a sense, we are not doing something which is very different from what human beings did. But important stuff is getting things connected, getting things to work for us is much more important than we people coming together. Okay? I think that is what is actually going to happen for the next wave of what we call the net 3.0, where you will actually find that we go beyond connecting computers and human beings, and we will connect many, many things, okay? So let me give a simple example, what is possible today, to what is possible maybe in the five to 10 years, probably it may take 15 years, I don't care, but what is important is, it is immensely possible, and I think in some sense, IBM's vision of smarter planet is all about that, okay? Let me talk about uh, something, you see, I don't know how many of you know that in uh, early 40s and 50s, there were mathematicians who would be actually asked to come before some of the flights will start. And these people will actually sit in the plane, get a whole bunch of equations solved so that they can actually plan their trajectory and they can actually find out what is going to be the time, come up with alternate plans because they would actually have access to a lot more amount of weather-related data about the plane, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand it used to take about 40 to 50 minutes before the planes take off. Today, maybe there's an IBM computer inside a cockpit, and when everything is ready, the captain tells you that, look, our onboard computers tell us today's flight time is going to be nine hours and 15 minutes, and depending on how the um, the wind speed is, it could vary from nine, nine hours, 10 minutes to nine hours, 29 minutes. And invariably you find you are right, okay? So these kind of connecting computers and human beings and things were available for the pilot and the plane. I see no reason why it can't be available between passengers and the plane. It's kind of stupid today to really think about it with everything available on the machine that you have to go there and look for a boarding pass. And the boarding pass has to be checked by so many human beings, right? And in fact, if you actually see places like Bangalore Airport, because I've been involved with that, you know that 
if you look at the backs at the uh, other side of the baggage handling, there are a lot of kind of online barcode readers and all, they constantly read it. I still remember we are, I'm a old time industrial engineer as a profession. We were the guys who created what is called barcode. And remember there used to be a time when people used to struggle. Oh, it's not reading, it is not reading. But nowadays you don't even care, right? Things are moving and barcodes are read. And so what happens is that there is no reason why so many of these systems which we are doing actually have to happen. So you should actually be able to get into the port, airport, keep walking, and everywhere in the airport would know that this idiot has come, he has checked in, and he goes to the flight, and there is no reason why people have to make an announcement. And there is no reason why people have to look at this display board, right? They know that everyone has a phone. You exactly know that this is the terminal where you are going. You can actually be told in Tamil or Kannada or Hindi or English that please go there. And you can actually have some people as a backup in case it is necessary. And I tell you, there is no reason why we all have to wait by the side of the belt looking for the bag, okay? The moment your bag is put on the belt, you can actually get message, your bag has been put. And in fact, when the bag is nearby, it can actually give you an audio clue, pick, it, pick me up. It's just no big deal, right? Absolutely no big deal, but it doesn't happen. That's a different thing, okay? So what I'm saying is that there is sufficient amount of embedded intelligence, quite often tracked by some machine made by Guraj Rao and his friends. Some IBM mainframe must be tracking all of it. So don't necessarily look at big data as something elsewhere, right? All these things are part of big data, okay? It's all there, but we are just not able to get it. I, for one, is a great believer. In fact, Bill, Bill Gates has actually funded, at some point in time, you know, there are companies which are working on. So there is no reason why we can't make planes which are as smart as a car, okay? In a sense, as easy as a car. So remember that when we moved from bullock carts and horse carts, okay, people did not necessarily believe that everyone will be able to drive. But today we all drive. And there is no reason why we all can't drive a plane and land wherever we want. Maybe that is the only solution for problems of Bangalore, right? You can never build roads, right? <laughs> okay? So why not think about it? You know, it's absolutely crazy today, but actually speaking, I don't know whether you have seen even IBM has some very nice uh, videos and autonomous uh, vehicles, right? So you actually see there is no reason why you need traffic signal. Because the cars can actually negotiate, right? When I'm nearby, the fellow stops, right? Automatically, right? And the driver will not be able to overrule it, right? So you can actually do negotiation, and some of these negotiations actually happen. See, I tell you, you go to Frankfurt Airport, right? The trains come, the trains negotiate, right? There's no driver, okay? So what happens is it's possible, of course, right now, is it scalable to the kind of traffic which you see in Bangalore and Delhi? The answers are not. But that is what IBM is all about, right? You will make processors which are faster enough. No big deal, right? That's what you have been doing for 100 years. I'm sure you will do much better in the next 10 years, right? So what is happening is that you will actually see some of these things scale. And I think, you know, like how many of you believe that in the Google car, some of us are great believers that Google car will become a reality. So 2020, okay? And this is my personal take. And we have actually done a few things, I should also tell you. But we actually found that, you know, it's a very, one of the most pedantic IT application, but nonetheless very satisfying. We find that there are large places in India. You know, India is a country with the largest number of cows. And you all know India is the only country where you find a good number of cows on the road also, <laughs> okay? So there is a place where we have a few thousands of cows. And this is part of a dairy. And some of the cows, like human beings, are also lazy, okay? So what happens is they don't go and eat. And what happens is there's a particular cow shed, okay? There's a time, there's a bell, etc. All the cows go, eat. And then afterwards, of course, the reason why they are interested is they want to suck the milk and they don't eat well, they don't give enough milk, so obviously. So they're actually looking for an interesting solution. So we actually put a nice geofencing solution. So what happens is you have a tag for each cow. If the cow has not moved enough, then we know, we know that the cow has not gone for its eating. So somebody goes and does whatever is necessary, okay? So I tell you, geofencing is so simple. We actually put out in Chennai, in Chennai city, we're doing a project. 
see a lot of buses, okay, deviate from the route and you can't find out. Is it no problem? We put a geofencing, right? So all that we do is you have some kind of intelligence, whichever form you want, okay, and you have GPS, you know what is the border of a fence within which the particular thing has to be there. Whenever it goes out, you can actually fence it and automatically flash it somewhere. So geofencing is so easy. And we are actually trying to do it in one of the ashrams. See, we have a lot of uh, senior citizens. And their biggest problem is the parents, the children are in United States or in Europe. They want to kind of keep track. So every day they want to call, etc. Some of them have email, etc. And sometimes they stray away. It is impossible to kind of keep track of them. What better technology than geofencing? Geofencing is one one technology. All that you need is a GPS chip and you need some way of communication. If you have a GPS chip and communication, you want to check whether your father by mistake has not kind of walked out of your home or something like that, somewhere else, doable. But what will be much more interesting, this is what I call personal medicine. You might have heard about it. People have started writing about it is that, look, your father or mother is living thousands of miles away, and uh, unfortunately, you are not able to live with him, and culturally, they don't like a servant to be staying all the time with them, but you want to ensure that they take the medicine correctly. Okay? Once again, I know for donkey's years, I used to be involved with SAP. Because of the FDA and other regulations, so many of the sophisticated drugs Every one of those uh, little packets, they actually have a small barcode in. Okay? They're actually tracked to the production. So you can actually go back. There's a nice system of production tracking. Okay? So there is no reason why when your father or mother, by mistake, forgets to take a medicine, you cannot be sounded in the next half a minute. More interesting stuff. By mistake, they take a wrong medicine. Okay? Today, technically, it is possible. The medicine can talk to your dad and tell him, no, this is not for you. Right? No big deal. Right? But you just have to build systems. If you really look at it, each one of them is individually doable. But what IBM kind of companies have to do is to get the system in place. Right? We have to have end-to-end -end kind of stuff. Okay? So and if you do that, what a difference you will make. Okay? And you really look around, particularly in countries like India, enormous number of jobs, okay? they're just not suited for human beings. And human beings also curse. They're not even well-paid jobs. At least the well-paid jobs, it is okay. okay? And quite often, they're poorly done. Okay? A whole range of them, you know, call it surveillance, whatever, etc. Okay? And of course, this is something which Samsung has done a nice thing Again, isolated one. You know, you must have heard of Samsung's uh, uh, refrigerator. Okay, when the uh, when the level is low, it will automatically send an SMS. Okay, I see no reason why most of our refrigerators can automatically kind of tell you that it is time to fill. As a matter of fact, they can go one more step ahead. Most of the time, you buy from the same thing. They can place an order. Uh, no big deal, right? And in fact, much more interesting stuff. If you actually confirm the order on the way you pick it up, by the time you come, I see no reason why we should have the checkout, uh, checkout counters. Checkout counters are completely meaningless stuff today, right? But the little.